All right, it's time for the next panel. And I see Todd, we're going to take over. Uh, yes. And the others waiting, I can let them in, Todd. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, thanks. All right. Hello, Heidi. Hello, Rachel. So nice uh, that you could join us at a time that you're probably double booked for many things. So I appreciate this. Um, so let's see. I think what I'm going to do is I see that you provided a uh, it's intros for you. <laughs> and so um, I'm just going to read these. And you know what? I was just I, I was realizing this as I was looking through these that. Um, I don't. Oops. I don't think I've ever heard your last names pronounced. And so I, instead of even trying, um, <laughs> Heidi, how do you pronounce your last name? It's Schleyline. Schleyline. OK, that's I think I was going to get something like that. OK, you, you, you. I know you would have had it, Todd. <laughs> Well, my, uh, my last name is Therialt and it's always mispronounced. So it's, you know, I get it. Uh, Heidi is one of the medical illustrators working on the HubMap project. She primarily digitally sculpts the organs used in the RUI and the EUI using Maya and ZBrush. She has been sculpting medical models since graduating from the biomedical visualization program at the University of Illinois, Chicago in 2010. She also works full time as a graphic designer and webmaster for the University of Illinois Chicago College of Applied Health Sciences. In addition, she owns the company SciSculpt, a medical model company, and has worked with various researchers and physicians to create medical models that have been used around the world. Uh, she enjoys working in the academic space and the challenge of mapping the human body. And then I'm going to also introduce Rachel. Bajima. You okay. <laughs> okay. I, I was going to go Bajima, but no, Bajima. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Rachel is one of the other medical illustrators <laughs> working on the HubMap project. That's nice. Uh, she is primarily <laughs> responsible for 2D illustrations of functional tissue units, FTUs. Maybe she can explain what those are. Um, <laughs> created using traditional drawing layered with digital coloring. Uh, Rachel received her BA in Biological Sciences from the University of Southern California and her MS in Biomedical Visualization from the University of Chicago at Illinois. Rachel operates, say it again. Bajima Studios. Bajima, yeah, Bajima. Bajima Studios, LLC, uh, providing medical illustration and animation services for academic, pharmaceutical, and educational clients. She is a printmaker, painter, and outdoors woman. She is the editor of the Medical Illustration Sourcebook and a professional member of the Association of Medical Illustrators, Guild of Natural Sciences, uh, American Association for Anatomy and Seattle Print Arts. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. And let me just. So I think we wanted to start with um, each of you giving us an overview of um, well, who you are, how, where, where you're, where you're from, how, influences, or um, uh, how you got your start, but also what you do with with HubMap, what you do outside of HubMap. Um, but what we, I think we really like to see the work that you create. So um, it would be it'd be great. I can either uh, drive the slides, or if you uh, want to just share a screen, you you can do that. But Heidi, can we start with you? Sure. Um, I think I'll just share my screen. I'm going to do a mix of slides and me. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. That's yeah. great. So um, let me just, actually, I don't know how to make. All right. I'll just share the screen. Okay. Is this good enough for slides or I can make it a slideshow? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's better. Okay. Nice. Um, yeah. So I decided to start with pottery. Um, I've been making pottery since high school and I really love it. And I think this kind of drives the 3D nature of my work. I'm very interested in sculpture as well. Um, I have a couple, actually, I'll show you when I go back to when I stop sharing my screen. Um, yeah, so this is kind of where my love of art and 3D started was in high school. And I did pottery all through college. I still do pottery. I just bought a house and plan on putting in a ceramic studio in the garage. 
Um, so I'm very excited to continue that and build out my own studio. This is what I do in my spare time when I'm not working on HubMap or UIC work. Um, right now, it's actually building the studio, but before it used to be actually making pottery. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, after, well, in, I guess, I where should I start? Let's see here. So in undergrad, I went to school in Wisconsin and I double majored in fine art and psychology. And I was going to be a art therapist. Um, my One of my requirements for psychology was to take an anatomy and physiology class. And I just fell in love with the human body. I was like, this is amazing. Like, there's so much to learn here. <laughs> so I had an advisor who um, recommended that I look into going into psychiatry instead. And that would mean getting a medical degree. Um, and I didn't have any of the requirements to go to med school. I kind of avoided science my whole life. I thought it was not art. You know, it wasn't it wasn't for me. Psychology was, was as much science as I wanted to get into. Um, but I decided to take her advice. And I went to Boston for a post-baccalaureate pre-med program um, to get my my pre-med requirements and uh, did that whole program. I loved it. I was in the ceramic studio in all my spare time um, and really thought, you know, as I learned more about medicine and med school that I really wouldn't have time to do art. And since that was really where I spent my spare time, I thought maybe I could do something else that would kind of combine my love of art and medicine. And I uh, just stumbled across a blog of a medical artist one day and kind of cyber stalked her, figured out where she went to grad school, how she got into it. Um, she went to University of Toronto. So I called the um, program at Toronto and talked with the program director um, who explained to me what it was and what I need to do. And I thought, this is a perfect fit. Let's do it. Um, so I went to grad school at University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, and I focused on, on sculpture, like, um, like learning the 3D world. We learned um, 3ds max there at the time i learned some zbrush there um and kind of focused all my extra classes on that um so after grad school i got a job at um, gpi anatomicals which is about 40 miles outside of chicago and i made these models that you see here um for gpi anatomicals um they were created digitally and then they'd be 3D printed and then made, uh, manufactured in China and distributed throughout the world. And I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen because I have some here. I have, as a result of this, I have many body parts in my home. They're all plastic, <laughs> but um, but they're everywhere. So well, I thought I'd show some since they're here and um, most people aren't very interested in them. So now hopefully someone will be. <laughs> Um, this is a gout foot that I made. Uh, I made this and, and um, one of my my um, my heroes, I guess, in the field was Ray Evenhaus, and he was a phenomenal uh, sculptor. Uh, he did a lot of traditional media and he also worked at GPI Anatomicals, kind of more on a consulting basis. But he started this model and I kind of took it over from him and finished it. So it, it has some meaning to me because he was such a great um, role model and it was amazing to get to be able to work with him. Um, but you can see the gouty toe looks very painful. <laughs> and uh, yeah, people say, oh, well, my foot doesn't look like that. And I realized later on, I kind of modeled it on my foot, which which I didn't mean to, but um, everyone's foot looks different, you know, so. Um, and then this was actually my first model that I made for GPI. Um, this was an osteoarthritic hand. I made a osteoarthritis and a rheumatoid arthritis hand. Um, and this is kind of typical of my style. It's more, uh, it's very, very realistic, I'd say, com compared to some of the other medical sculptures I was working with was a little more um, like didactic, like it wouldn't have all these veins and stuff. And I'm not actually sure how commercial this style is because we did sell this model um, to a company, but they wanted us to smooth out the hand <laughs> and take out all the veins and, and bones. Um, so, you know, it's maybe not for everyone. Um, this is a teeth, also one of my first models I made was a teeth model that shows all the pathologies and then normal teeth on this side, which I keep this in my bathroom. <laughs> nice. uh, 
you kind of have to have a sense of humor if you're in my house. And uh, this is a heart model um, to show the stent. I worked on this with some other coworkers. I created the valves. Um, they did like the rest of the heart. You can show like this um, goes through. It's the balloon. And it will inflate in the stent, you know. And then I thought I'd show one more. Um, this is a, another stent model that was made for, was it for Cook Medical? Um, these were a lot more technical to make, um, but it was, you know, it's always a challenge to show, well, you want to show how the stent looks in the body. This is actually maybe a little bit bigger than life size, but pretty close. Um, and they wanted, you know, you want to show that how it would look in the body, but also be able to show the stent. So um, we made half of it clear and half the other half is like the um, vessel. So there's there's some interesting challenges um, with that job. After working there for a while, I decided to create my own company, um, doing basically the same thing, um, making medical models. And I've done a couple of um, models for for researchers. And um, I also do websites. And as I was doing um, this company, I got into more design work. Uh, I worked for an ad agency in Milwaukee um, and then got this or uh, started this position at UIC. And our main design project is the alumni magazine that comes out twice a year. These are some spreads from that magazine of the Beavis program and then our COVID spread. Um, it's been really fun to expand my design skill set there. Um, I also make websites for a lot of researchers there, uh, which is really fun to think about um, how to promote their research to the right audience and what you know visuals to use, what language to use. Um, and I think I've built about 30 websites um, for the different researchers and labs at the College of Applied Health Sciences. Um, so yeah, that's been really fun to work with that group. Um, and then my HubMap work. Um, so I create, I took over the position from Kristen Brown and she created most of these organs um, from the visible human data set. And um, I kind of picked up where she left off. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see there's this, uh, the vertebrae and then the uh, spinal cord. Um, there's a placenta model. And uh, I did recently did a breast model. Um, and these are used in the RUI and EUI. And these also have a very you know, specific purpose that they're meant to help researchers place the tissue samples in the human body. So they may not have every anatomical structure. It's not meant to be an exact replication of a human body, um, but kind of a, a framework so that the researchers know where they are in the human body to place their tissue sample. And um, just a uh, issue I had to problem solve was uh, in the lower left-hand corner, you can see the small intestines and researchers were having a hard time knowing where they were in the small intestines. Mm. So I placed these markers kind of along the way. So you can kind of count, you know, I'm 10 centimeters in, 20 centimeters, you know, so you know where your tissue sample came from, especially because everyone's intestines looks different. So it kind of provides a general um, a general measurement that anyone could use to place tissue samples. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. That's, that's where I'm at now <laughs> doing HubMap and the design work. Thank you. Uh, uh, hey, I just have a, a, a quick question about the, um, small intestines. Is this, is this, um, kind of maneuvered to show more of the surface area so that you can, it's easier to place or how is this kind of, um, pictured for so researchers can kind of get in there and, and place place their um, tissue samples yeah it, it looks like what you see here so um, you can select a marker and I think no you just you would have to place it actually but these markers are all labeled there's like a list on the side that labels them all so you could um, you know select the say the 10 centimeter mark and then place your tissue sample there but but mm -hmm. it isn't stretched out or anything um okay yeah so when um when we go into the rui uh this the stuff that we see there those are things that you're responsible for for doing 
Yep. Some of them. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you very much. And um, let's, and we'll talk more, um, but let's uh, move to Rachel and uh, I'll let you just uh, take it away. Thanks. Um, Todd, do you mind driving my slides? Actually, I don't think I have them pulled up yet. I got it. I got um, it. All right. I'm just going to do the easy part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do the it. tech part. <laughs> that's, really, that's really cool to see some of your models, Heidi. Heidi and I have a really similar background. We both went through that UIC program. Um, so, oh, and that didn't, that didn't update. That is not, hold on. Let me save my, my beautiful prints. Um, so I... Um, let me see. All right, go ahead, Todd. Go ahead. Let me see if I can. Um, hey. Let me see if I can real <laughs> quick just kind of. You know what? Otherwise, I can probably drive it. Let me see. No, I, I think I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was doing this. I, can we see that? I need to admit it, but it's true. <laughs> Always. Um, yeah, so. so um, <laughs> Hold on one second. See a real physical model because that is what inspired me to become a medical illustrator. Actually, I was in um, working on it my way through a science degree and not really um, having very much of a background in art. Oh, thank you, Kati. She gave me a link. Um, and um, and oh, let me pull this up really quickly. I've got it here. If you, uh, I, I can. That's okay. Here we go. Okay, so then, um, so I came in um, more through a science track, actually. So I, I studied, uh, I was in California studying, and um, my lab partner kind of did did a little like, hey, you know, this, this model of a heart in lab, like this, you should be doing this stuff. Look, at someone had to draw this, someone had to do this. This is you, this is, she saw it, and I didn't recognize it myself. So my path started kind of struggling my way through, I guess I have to learn how to draw if this is my thing. And my drawing has actually always looked a lot like this. It, it's, um, I had drawing teachers who told me always that I should be a printmaker, but I didn't have time to learn. And this is something that I picked up as an adult in Seattle. Um, during kind of a down time, I took some time off to have kids and was working less and thought, you know, I'm really going to give this printmaking thing an actual try here. Let's, let's try it and see if I can learn how to do a printmaking <laughs> and have really enjoyed this kind of physical process. Um, and this, this work predates HubMap by quite a bit, I think. My work with HubMap when I was making more physical work. And as you'll see, this kind of carries through to what I'm really actually doing with this cellular thing. I've always been really interested in, in the biological end of, of pattern making and how, I mean, you can see how it relates to the cellular landscape behind me. This kind of idea that there are these functional repeating mathematically based units and a lot of chaos in nature that actually relates and, and serves a function and serves a purpose and, and relates to, to a whole, to systems. And so um, this is a little bit of my work. Um, Rachel, my kind of, yeah. Uh, is it possible for you to go into, um, the presenter mode or the slideshow mode Hi. so we can see these a little bit closer or else I, sure. I can, excuse me here. How's this? Okay. Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Big. It's big. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so just, I mean, again, I, I just somehow enjoy this really detailed. It's, um, been calming and I, I don't really have the time for this in my day-to-day -day life now, but, um, I'm looking forward to getting, making my way back here. Um, what I spend most of my time doing now is commercial work for, um, for different clients through my, uh, freelance business. So a lot of actually 3d work, which more overlaps with what Heidi's doing and, um, looking for ways when I can to do more traditional work. So uh, I've had a lot of high tech clients in the last few years who have really asked me to go backwards and do, um, do more traditional work, which is kind of really interesting. I'm seeing this trend where I'm being asked to do more hand colored, um, colored pencil work and, and actual hand pen and ink work. And um, Heidi, if I knew we were doing show and tell, I, oh, I have one here. Um, so now I've got ink, ink work all over my desk where I'm always, uh, will it work? Will it work? 
<laughs> the magic of 3D. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyway, I do a lot of pen and ink these days, which is kind of fun and really unusual. When we were in school, it was all 3D, 3D, 3D. And I found this to be a really, really interesting throughput again to coming into a space where there is much more technical demand in art and finding that actually some of the best served visuals like this lower left uh, example here that I have on the screen, this is for one of my highest tech clients and they needed a way to super strip down all the detail and all the visual noise from how does their very high tech, you know, sorting and, and you know, background work work, how can we make this very simple, very conceptual? I'm finding that there's really more and more of a need to really strip down the complexity and and illustrate things in a way that's much simpler. So it's it's been an interesting kind of uh, through line from learning these kind of, how do you make the most complicated looking 3D thing that you can make? And Heidi, probably you've seen this in your work too with animation. How can we make these really complicated cellular interactions and landscapes? Well, a lot of what we're doing now is stripping that away and, and getting back to illustration, which is interesting. And it relates a lot to my work for HubMap again. Uh, here's again, a very technical client. A lot of the HubMap work is based on artificial intelligence and machine learning. But my piece of it is trying to make it as very simple as possible. How do you strip down to its essence? What is actually uh, the smallest unit of functional tissue that we can get? What's one of these smallest repeating functional relationships that builds a system? So really looking at stripping, uh, stripping down, you know, these ones I have over here in the black and white scale were kind of experiments to say, uh, how can we illustrate? Here's generally how big these things are. Here's the density of cells. Here's, here's, you know, we'll do insets to show you what's actually in here, but, but here's what we're calling a functional tissue unit. And you can kind of see it in this different way. So playing with ways to simplify um, some of these more complicated cellular data sets. And then the next step of this, so we're up to 19 of these functional tissue units that, that we've illustrated and researched at this point, um, we'll be linking these two data sets and putting this on the, the website starting, I think this spring is the, the goal to publish this as an interactive module while you're, you're going to be able to start really working with this and trying to see how does this relate to the data that we have. The end. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> you know what? I I was looking because I was like, I think I've seen these in the in the trivia that we did today. Your, oh, sure. Uh, are yep. Part of the trivia. Yay. Questions. The, your, your Crypto Libricon. <laughs> <Right there. laughs> cool. Which I don't know. We're getting away from a lot of these named, you know, terms in anatomy. So maybe colonic crypt is, is where we're going here. But it, mm. anatomy is so interesting in that in some respects, it never, 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 never changes. And in some respects, we're always changing something anyways. It's, it's an interesting field. Right. Uh, you know, I well, one of the questions that I had is it, just, it seems like it's an incredibly dynamic field in that you not only have to keep up with new developments in the science, um, but also in the visualization and is how do you do that? How do you keep up with kind of like keep your uh, your fingers on on two different fields at, in a sense? Um, is it a constant, you know, just learning and learning and learning, or or do you get to a point where you're like, okay, I've got this? Or how how does that work for each of you? Yeah. I, I Okay. <laughs> we'll probably have the same answer. I research everything I do. We, we forget a lot, I, you know, and, and so if I'm working a lot with a certain subject material with a certain, um, you know, organ system or, or a certain scale, maybe it will be lighter, but I'm always looking back to um, my office is just full of, of visual references and papers and all kinds of things. And I'll, I'll, um, be asking clients often for what are your most helpful materials and be looking at what they've published. Um, and it is always learning, but yet you have to kind of, again, stripping it down to what you know, what you are comfortable with, right? If I have a deadline, I have to produce something. I may not have time to, to learn an entirely new um, tool to make it, even though maybe there might be a better tool out there. It's just always kind of trying to do the best you can with the tools that you have, putting it together, stepping forward over time. But it really is a lot of learning when you have time and working towards making time in your workflow. 
Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's, um, yeah, for the 3D programs, there's always more brushes than I'll ever know that they do oh, or more, you know, it's, so a lot of it is learning as I need it. It's like, oh, I need, um, you know, like those, those, that measurement for the small intestines. I just learned that as I needed it, that was some like Python script that I found online that worked in Maya. So it's just a lot of problem solving. Like, what could I use this to, to do this or how can I get this, you know? Um, so yeah, it's uh, a lot of Googling <laughs> and, and finding <laughs> tutorials. And, you know, once you know the program, you kind of know the language, so you can kind of put it together a bit quicker, but you'll never know the full extent of the program. So, And it's amazing how every job is a custom solution. Oh, that's the other thing I find. It does. It kind of doesn't matter. It's always, um, always something different. Even if I think I'm just going to pick up a pencil and draw something for a client, it's, it's still going to look different this time. It's still going to be a different thing. It's still going to have a different layer, a different paper, a different meaning. It's, it's very interesting as a job. Yeah. And, and a lot of, of that is to just, you know, thinking who this is for, who's the audience, what's the purpose, what's the end goal, because you could get carried away and how it could look and how, you know, it could be one thing, but if it doesn't accomplish the mission, then it, it didn't work. So that's, that's one way that I use to narrow it down. What's the best way to get this communicated, I guess. And that's oftentimes on a project by project basis, as you say, it's, it's a solution thing. Yeah. yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Um, another question that I had for you um, was, was, it seems that you you two are responsible for establishing the visual landscape of hub map you know in in a sense and and can carrying it on and I, you know i think it, it, looking at other projects that you do how do you um how do you establish a sort of visual style that is elastic enough that you can kind of change it as as requirements go if you're working on a singular project and you know you're responsible for, for kind of having s- some uniformity and some like stylistic continuity but also something that can can change um over time is that is that something that factors into uh or that keeps you keeps you up at night when you're starting a project or something like how i, I did, <laughs> put the pen to the paper and it's you know set in stone or how do you how do you manage that that this is real relevant to me todd um we actually just had a discussion this this week because the illustrations that i did for you know you could see the style and 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 what we had developed we're trying to apply them to to oh can we do them use them for this other purpose well they don't work exactly well for this other purpose because they were designed to work for the for the original you know the original intent doesn't always carry through to every use case so you could actually continually change the style of what we've done. You could always continually improve it or, or, um, and these are not, um, what's the word? It's not an objective answer. The, the visual solution that we've proposed is of course subjective and is our visual solution. Someone else will always do it differently and it could always be done. It could always be done in variation. And so the thing to do, the thing that we looked at with, with the 2d work anyway, for hub map is I really established that style of it the at the outline when you zoom in and look at my uh, functional tissue unit illustrations, it really is a sketch. It's a it's a pencil to paper sketch that I've digitized and then and then colored in a way that makes it that's you know usable at different scales and for different purposes. But the idea is it it, sh- it should look like and is something that can change in iteration because we're continuing to change the research every cycle in theory. We could update every illustration we've done as new cell types are added to these to the tables where I'm pulling the data from in order to, to create these illustrations. So my visual solution for the illustration was to actually make it look like a sketch so that it gives the impression and is something I can change quickly and can always be iterative. And what I found even in, in decisions like the colors have changed over time, you know, as we've needed different different size palettes, different relationships, um, they do change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say it um, doesn't really apply to my work because um, mine is just a framework. Um, not just, but it's it's a framework. It's not meant to represent any more than a representation of like the heart, you know, an organ, whatever organ it is. 
So um, if we were rendering these organs out as images and working with lighting and textures and getting into the details of, you know, the muscle texture and all that, then I think that would be more stylistic choices there. Um, but as far as sculpting, it's really, I sculpt with the subject matter expert once and um, I, I follow the, the style that Kristen did, which is, um, you know, not too detailed. Um, cause it's just meant to be a framework, not an actual, you know, doesn't have textures and colors and, and all that stuff. So yeah, Piety could spend a year doing the most beautiful detailed version of a kidney that you've ever seen, <laughs> but it would take her a year and, uh, yeah. we want, we want a more holistic solution. Right. And same with the, uh, with the illustrations, it's kind of a volume game for HubMap in a way as well. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And again, like as well right like what what's the end goal you know it's for me it's not really to have a, a beautiful um model at the end of the day you know it, it should be accurate um but it's really about it i think yeah there's a couple of uh interesting questions here in the in the chat one from andrea um how how many sketches attempts do you need to do for each piece uh 2d ftu illustrations or 3d foot um that's a kind of a nuts and bolts uh question it is uh, what i do when i'm working uh, and i think a lot of artists start with this i i keep a sketchbook by my desk and as I'm even thinking about an FTU, like Andrea asked this question, so I'll tell you about the um, like the, the spleen that we've started and haven't finished yet. That went through a series of thumbnails as I'm reading your papers and, and thinking about it and, and looking again at, at all the histology books. Okay, what are people showing when they're showing the white pulp of the spleen? What, what are other people showing? What are they looking at? And I'm starting to draw real, I've got to fill a page of, of what we call a thumbnail sketch where I'm just thinking. And then eventually that gets bigger and I'll start trying to do, um, oh, and I wish I was prepared. I, I have, um, um, you know, Heidi, when you talk, I'll go dig in my drawers and, and actually bring some out to show because the next thing I do is I start going in, in fuzzier detail, whole paper size where the spleen has just hundreds and hundreds of cells that I drew for the white pulp. And I'm starting to get bigger and I'm starting to think about relationships and I'll have to draw the full scale illustration at least twice in completion before I'm even happy with that as a sketch. And it goes to, and often if it's a smaller, simpler FTU, I'll draw it several times before I even send that off to review because it gets better every time I draw it. And I'll send that off for review. Often it's reviewed two, three times, just depends on the team and on the expert and it'll come back and I'll tweak it. And then I'll do one final revision and then hope that that's it where everything gets redrawn and everything gets hand colored. And then I'll hold my breath and wait <laughs> and then I'll change it anyway. So it's, it is kind of a big iterative process where I'm trying to um, do it quickly, but the drawing actually goes through very many rounds of revisions for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess I don't really sketch too much for HubMap um, anymore. Um, no, I, I not at least in the organs that I've done. Um, but like the the um, I just finished a breast model, and I'm talking um, with a subject matter expert who is kind of showing me that. I did the lobes, there's there's many ways to interpret how the lobes in, in the breast uh, look and, and work. And um, he is probably the most knowledgeable person on that. And, and a lot of the illustrations that I use and kind of based my model off of are probably wrong that I'm, I'm realizing. Um, so I'm kind of going back and forth with him and, and thinking, okay, well, how does this actually look? You know, if these illustrations aren't accurate, then does anyone really know? <laughs> Are you the only person that knows? Mm -hmm. So we're kind of, um, I'm kind of going back to the drawing board with the breast model um, and talking with him about that. Um, so, so yeah, my models are also iterative, you know, as more information comes up or as, um, as, as there's different use cases for them or different researchers that have different knowledge of the gross anatomy, um, then that will change too. Um, and that's for HubMap for like the 3D foot. This was a completely different design process because this did start with a sketch that I um, pitched to my bosses. Like, okay, I think we should section 
you know, the big toe this way, not three quarters, not less than half. I think it should be half. I think we should show the bone. I think we need to show the gout, you know, here and larger probably than most people would see it just to make it more sensational. Um, it's like every little detail and the gout can also form here. So, and I mean, I, I started this model by researching for about two days about gout um, and then taking notes, taking sketches, putting it together. And I usually presented about 10 different um, options for one model. So, you know, we could, we could have sectioned the whole foot in half and shown it, um, or we can do these little cutaways. And then it's like, should this cut plane, this is on a kind of a curved surface. Could it be curved or at right angles? Um, with these models, you also have to think about 3D printing and manufacturing. So you don't want, you know, undercuts um, because that can't be molded. Uh, so there's, yeah, there, it's a totally different process than than what I'm doing for HubMap, even though it still is just 3D modeling. Um, it's very, very different. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got a, um, I'm going to try to turn my background off a minute. And then my camera might work a little bit better. Um, so let's see if, if this works. Okay, so here's, here's like an early phase of the liver where I was playing around with, with like, oh, what perspective should I make this? Should I try it? We were working with the expert for a while. Should I flip it and make it more 3D? Mm -hmm. I've got, um, then I'm going into, okay, what is it, what does it look like if I'm drawing that in a cellular? I think this is the first thing I actually showed to the client. So I don't, I don't keep everything. I have reams of paper, but you know, here's maybe the next iteration that actually went to the subject matter expert for the liver. And we're talking about, is this the right number of cells? Is the right representation of cells? But they're not seeing anything in color or annotated at this point. I'm trying things like, uh, what does it look like if we get more abstract? Does this still look correct? This is based exactly on my drawing. I think I traced this, blew it up and traced it so that it's a one-to-one -one, um, you know, overlay exactly. So, okay, does that still look uh, representative? And then I'm going into uh, iterative details on, I drew the insets really large first um, and, and worked out the details in the layout as I went smaller. I don't know. So just, just round after round of sketches where I'm kind of refining and we're talking and I'm showing and, um, and adding detail on every, every time. That's really fascinating. I'm, I'm glad that you, you rummaged through your desk to get those because it is, it is really cool to see kind of the how this um, plays out and how the how the process and the revision process kind of works. Yeah. Um, and they're added in layers, too, sometimes where I've got like, here's a layer. I thought, oh, you know, we still need a blood. So we need more blood supply on the portal channels. So here's here's another layer. I just drew that totally separately and added that on. So it's always kind of shifting a little bit and layered on top of each other before I even get to the final Right. <laughs> this this is a question from Ellen. It seems like di right directed to what you just were talking about. Um, <laughs> yep. so, Rachel, you don't use an electronic yes. tablet. I do use Rachel a tablet. tablet. I use a tablet. <laughs> okay. However, this is then this is an artist thing. If I have a pencil in my hand, it's so much faster. If I'm drawing, I mean, this liver, I don't know how many hundreds of cells this is. It's so much faster to do on pencil. I do digitize the sketch and I color everything with the tablet, right? So everything I do after pencil is tablet. However, um, if I was gonna make a vector illustration with a tablet and make this vector illustration with a tablet, this would take so long. It just takes forever to, to have a digital pen and try to make those lines that then you, so you draw a line, you go back and edit it, it's very laborious. If I have a pencil, it's done. Mm. And it, yeah, it is unintuitive, it, it doesn't make any sense, but. But um, I do translate this into a digital sketch. So it becomes it becomes the same product as as my laborious digital pen. Uh, it's just faster. So um, just to double back, we've got a lot of a lot of questions, um, but this one kind of harkens back. This is from Andrea again. Um, it, you were talking about subject matter experts and working with subject matter experts and iterator, iterative process. Um, and this is, I think this is a really wonderful question. Um, how can subject matter experts help you with the process and what do your ideal collaborators do well? Oh, I'll tell you because we just got one. <laughs> we got a superstar <laughs> collaborator. <laughs> um, and, and to be honest, you're, all the subject matter experts have been very helpful. But but um, this this one team stood out because um, 
even and and it's it stood out because this was one of the ones that was a new one a new functional tissue unit for me and a new model for Heidi so um, most of the ones that we'd walked into, someone else had already started the process. There was already research in line. There was already something in place that we stepped into and picked up the pieces. When we started working with the breast team, the subject matter expert sent us a chapter that he had written, like a, a seminal chapter on, on, it just had all of the histological setup, all of the 3D modeling, all of the background. So before we even talked to him, he'd said, here's what I'm going to tell you to look at. And then we had a, a introductory conversation with him and he sent us immediately a series of follow-ups, right? With, with um, images that he was really thinking about. And um, I would say the differences, they were not things that he had pulled off of Google. They were just like, I, I, they were, they were useful in a different way. They had been like hand produced for his research. And so I looked at that and thought, okay, I know exactly what he's going to ask me to draw. Like he wants to see that. In, um, I like to look at a lot of stuff, but some things are overwhelming. They're visually overwhelming or they're too simple or they're, I have a hard time translating it to a, a specific scale, if that makes sense, because the hub map illustrations have to be at, at scale. So some, every illustration doesn't work for that. This is another one from Helen for, for Heidi, kind of on the subject again. Um, you, you, Heidi, you mentioned that breast model is going to be redone. How do you determine which SME is better than another? And the breast model had been approved by an SME who works on, on the breast. I don't know, Ellen, we should talk about this. <laughs> um, this is like, yeah. the, the one isn't better than another. That's no, it's also definitely not. And, and this just came up like yesterday um, that he was like, actually the lobes are like in layers, not separate sections. And, yeah, so um, I need to dig into it more, actually, and figure out exactly what he's saying and how it should look. Um, but, you know, and also I want to keep in mind that the end goal is so that researchers who are entering tissue samples into the RUI know where they are in the breast and that that tissue sample will contain all the anatomical structures that it would have, you know, in my model as in the body. So um, it may be that my model is is fine for that purpose. It may be that that I need to redo the lobes and the lactiferous ducts. Um, I don't know. So, you know, in the SME that already approved it, I believe is one that is entering tissue samples into the breast model. So um, if, if he's fine with where the locations are, then then maybe the model is fine. I, Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe that expert's helpful for the FTU, but not necessarily for the model. So there, there is yep. that, like we could endlessly iterate and make things more and more correct or more and more complex or more and more refined, but you do have to look at it and say, is it good enough for what we need it to do today? And can we spend time working on another model? Yeah. A question here from uh, Supriya. How do you decide the color range for each design and how do you validate it? Oh, that's a good one. It's it's tough because I made I made the um, color palette and there are colors I like. Like I, I use, I start with neutrals. If, if something is going to be kind of like the main color that you're looking at and there's a ton of cells, I like to start with the most neutral color. And then I need something that's going to be, um, there are some standards, right? I try to use the same color. Every red blood cell gets the same color. Every smooth muscle cell gets the same color. There are kind of epi epithelial cells. I try to keep those the same. So there are standards that I've tried to develop, but also there's too many cell types to have that work consistently. So then it just becomes a matter of balancing it, you know, I, and I don't know actually that anybody has approved the colors outside of our working group, outside of you know, the SMEs don't really tend to comment on the color. And that's, that's actually something I ask about because, because I could change everything. Boy, couldn't I? But um, I try to make a balanced illustration where there's a high contrast and there's not too much um, chaos to look at. We tried some higher chroma designs earlier on where there was more um, saturated color. And it was hard to look at. So there's some of it's just intuitive, knocking this down. There's too much yellow. It's too, this is too much for your eye. Mm -hmm. Yes, colorblind friendly. I have looked at that. And that's specifically, it's a problem because we do use red 
but I try to stay away from green and I check everything against a black and white kind of a grayscale um, check so that hopefully we're getting enough. I do run it through like a display check for web before it gets published. We try. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Just going to go back to the, the questions here. Thought I saw one. Uh, who inspires you? This is from An Andrea again. Uh, who inspires you? Do you use Netter, the Michelangelo of medicine? Uh, work raw data, imaging data. I like that. Who who inspires you? Go ahead, Heidi. I feel like you've been talking a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I use um, a lot of the visible human data for HubMap. I mean, that's what I use. Um, I well. Except for actually the breast model, because uh, the data wasn't very clear. Um, so for the breast model, I use, you know, I, there's that one, I don't know. I have a lot of books, I guess. I should <laughs> look through my books. There's a small <laughs> pile there. The the Christic, the human microscopic anatomy. Um, I, I, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say it's not really a particular art style for the HubMap project. It's more, um, what does the anatomy actually look like in 3D? How is it organized and packaged? And illustrations help, um, but at a certain point, you still have to visualize how it looks in 3D and how the size ratios and everything. So so rendering out from the MRI data is, is really helpful and being very accurate. Um, yeah, I, I would say, yeah, but that, that Christic book is phenomenal. His, the way that he illustrates and breaks down the anatomy is really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Connie's asking what our favorite medical oh. illustration book is. That's, that's one of mine. Yeah, and Heidi on that. It's really very creative. Yeah. And here, I've <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I've lost both of my guests now. Yeah. So you have the. Yeah. <laughs> right there. I, I mean, but but some of the, the <laughs> perspective he shows on some of this stuff. Okay, let me find some good ones. Because yeah. he really takes you on this journey where you're kind of looking at things. It's all about how can you look at something just a little bit differently? How can you kind of like shift your focus and perspective and draw something? Um, well, and he, he includes like this is what hasn't been done before. I don't know. Do you have it open? Yeah, it's like a renal corpus skull, but he also includes the dimension in the corner, which is so helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, anything with scale, honestly, is is like it's not always included, and it's so 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 important for what we're doing. Um, yeah. You know, of course, we use we use all the standards. We use Netter. We use you know, I've got all the theme atlases, and and there's just tons and tons of textbooks in my in my room. But I do I look at a lot of histology because I feel like you can't get better information if you're looking for realism realistic scale and relationships then to um to really look at at slices and slides and that's that's tough too i'm always looking at well is it human is it healthy human right a lot of the a lot of the histology that is out there for access is pathology so you're always kind of trying to make uh connections and uh guesses as you're absorbing you know kind of amassing resources for each project this is um oh so now you're flying fast and furious here uh, <laughs> sorry yeah I, okay. I, I, <laughs> this is this is a great what is your favorite anatomy movie fantastic isn't there one with dennis quaid where he goes inside <laughs> Like from the 90s or the 80s? No. Oh, I'm not sure. I mean, I do love Fantastic Voyage. That's that's a pretty classic one. And, and one of the ones that inspired our teachers to, to get into anatomy. I don't know that there are actually too many anatomy movies out there unless you're talking medical. <laughs> or like a horror movie. <laughs> Romance. Romance. <Yes. laughs> Any body horror movies that you yeah. I don't know. Kill Bill, not accurate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Todd. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say we missed a question. As people are chatting about Netter in here as, as a and um, it is interesting, right? Because one of the one of the problems and it's like the cursing and the bless of having some this blessing of so many resources at your fingertips is 
through the centuries, medical illustrators have been looking at the same things, right? We look at our own work. We, we try to, so this is why we try to look at what is the expert recommending to us for, for references, because a lot of what we see, a lot of what we study from, a lot of what we remind ourselves, we've, we've taken gross anatomy. So we have had the, the experience of dissection, but it was a long time ago. So we look at illustrations, we look at photographs, we look at other things. There are mistakes that have been copied over time. And even mm. some of the illustrators that we love that we use the most, I'll look at Netter first, no matter what my job is. Almost I have the whole, you know, the full SIBA collection back there and I'll get out the old things that he's done in the 50s. And they're still fantastic for teaching. But there are lots of mistakes in Netter that you have to be careful as you're interpreting and knowing what to look for to make sure we're not repeating those those mistakes. Mm -hmm. Ellen asks if, if, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I was going to say uh, for the 3D models too, I, re <laughs> a couple of years ago, I bought a lot of uh, medical models on eBay. <laughs> so I have a ton of really old, to, from like old till new um, medical models that I reference um, quite a bit. You know, it's, it's not a textbook, but it's interesting how they solved a lot of design problems. There's, there's another gout fit in there. Um, yeah, just a lot of different ways of showing these diseases. So, do you, do you um, do you have any uh, examples offhand of um, errors that have been copied throughout the over and over in terms of medical illustration that particularly come to mind? Kati asks, map makers of geospatial maps have copied errors extensively. What are the errors that medical illustrators copied? So we can all learn from our errors. And I mean, I wish I had, a, there's like, you can Google it. There's a list of like classic ones that are, that are, I don't know, Heidi, do you have any off the top of your head? Starting to think mammary, mammary lobes. Um, but. Well, exactly. <laughs> That's kind of the thing. The classic thing is when you pull it open and like, um, you know, there's, there's like a view, a set view that you expect to see an illustration of the liver or an illustration of the pancreas or something. And, and, and I think there's a, a mistake, a general mistake that we generalize the shape often of the organs. We don't, we don't take into account the way that the stomach has so much variation. We don't take into it. So there's kind of one classic stomach shape that everybody shows. Um, there's, there's often simplification of the tissue types that isn't really necessary. We just simplify it because we're not thinking about what else is there. Um, I don't know. There's all kinds of, there's all kinds of usually illustrators when they're learning will make the heart too big and the lungs too small. And <laughs> there's, mm -hmm. there's kind of a lot of, and not leave enough room for, for how much abdominal fat we have. Uh, people make all kinds of perception mistakes, all kinds of, um, you know, I, I was thinking about the pancreas again, because I was looking at some of my um, illustrations and thinking about drawing the pancreas as a, as a separate reference, and I saw a very good one recently where I realized, oh, it really, it should have more of a curvature at the front than you normally see illustrated or, or more of a dimensionality to, to the way that that shape actually sits in the body. And you really have to be thinking about that and, and allow yourself to be surprised, I think, by, by what is real versus what do you just see all the time? Mm -hmm. How I would answer that. <clears throat> Do either of you ever um, look to some of the the, the very older um, medical illustrations uh, for inspiration or anything like that? I, Marie Downheimer, uh, I think I've got her. Yes, Downheimer. Uh, she uh, gave a present, a really interesting presentation today, uh, and showed some um, illustrations from Albinius and uh, Vandelaar. And it, I think we all were kind of struck by just the the stuff that was also added, you know, the um, a beautiful Italian landscape or here's Cleo the rhinoceros, you know, <laughs> um, did it, do you ever look at those at all for any sort of inspiration or? Often, and I collect them and I beg clients to let me include those details. <laughs> I'm always looking for the chance to put in um, a whimsical background. Please let us draw them. <laughs> we love the whimsy in it. And I think it's, it adds a lot. It adds a lot of context. It helps us understand 
the time in which those were made and the things they were concerned with, all of the, the death representations in the early medical illustration, the, the different representations for, for the things they were afraid of, for the things that they thought were important in medicine. Um, it's mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. Heidi, how about you? Do you ever? Um, I, I actually, n- no, I would say, um, I mean, we've studied them, you know, but but I, um, when I go to art museums, I like to look at the sculptures. So like, you know, Michelangelo and Rodin is a big, um, I love his work. So the way that, you know, they sculpted a hand or the pose of the hand or the way they decided to represent, um, just, yeah, a lot of poses or how do they do the fingernails, you know, just little details. I like yeah, to look at that. Look at the, the wax models, you know, like the, the early... Mm-hmm you know, Italian wax models that were so realistic. I love that first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those are cool. Yeah. The color they got in. And again, the detail, like when you're talking about the detail in the hand and how maybe that wasn't commercial, that's actually what I love the most about medical illustration is when we are allowed to show specificity, it really represents variation. It represents real, real human people. Mm-hmm. I think it's important. It, it's interesting to hear you talk about that because it, it seems like there are some some um, push and pull um, issues that you need to kind of work with. And um, seeing that early representation uh, with, you know, not putting labels on it, but making it artistic, you know, that that was kind of what was what was wanted for that day. And so there's a there's sort of a compromise there. There's a push and pull of, of influences. What are some of the, the big push and pulls in, in, in medical illustration now in terms of, you know, is symmetry versus realism versus, you know, what what do you feel is some of the major ones? Do you have a thought, Heidi? I mean, it, like specifically, it's it's project based, um, okay. but generally, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Do we want to I'm talk about, a lot about diversity? Is is yes. what's really pinging in that discussion for me? Because mm-hmm. I will pitch. <laughs> here's your here's your patient with this. Um, you know, skin condition and, and in this doctor's office. And here's what the doctor looks like. And um, the specificity is important, but it has to be the right specificity. It has to really relate to the audience, but not be too, can't be too specific. If there's a very fine line, right? It has to relate, be relatable, but it cannot be too, too um, off-puttingly specific, if that makes sense. Diversity has been a big one. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much. Um, I was going to throw in um, with what I'm not going to in the last two minutes uh, to, for you to tell us how AI has affected the, your, your. Um, oh, we could talk old. for another hour. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, um, right. Um, did, does anyone have a, do you, do either of you have a quick, quick blurb about that? How, how artificial intelligence has. You want to take that one, Heidi? <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big well, one. I mean, it's, it's a big one. And, and yeah. right now we're watching, we're watching, we're, we're gently participating and we're watching to see because right now what we're seeing is the way that the tools are using what artists have already done and the way that they are talk about making mistakes. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's improved markedly over time. And we're watching this in the hub map world too, looking for how, can these things perform and help and how are they actually making things less, less correct, less helpful. Um, it's just a huge, huge, interesting thing. And artists right now are a little bit in, in this middle place of caring deeply about it and what it means for our work and being excited by what it means for our work. But also it's scary when, when you can punch in a series of keywords and have an illustration pop out in your style. Mm-hmm. that you didn't create that you're not paid for and that you don't own. Um, it's, it's a hard place for artists, but I think a lot of people are looking for the opportunity and trying to see how does it make their work faster? How does it make their work better? How can it add to what we're doing? Right. Yeah. This, that was unfair. I'm going to throw that in at the last. No, time. it's a good it question. Is, yeah, it's, it's um, 
yeah, I'm sure that's on, on your mind. Thank you so much. This was so great to to um, for, for you two to open up about your process and about the the issues that you deal with. Um, and I think we're all um, so much uh, have benefited from kind of having this insight. And so thank you so much. Thank you for the things that you showed and for being flexible, especially. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Great panel. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. And, and yes, AI is making a lot of mistakes, right? <laughs> <laughs>